So we're going to, you've had a week to ponder on it. Um, does anybody have any questions about the, our discussion last week about the two witnesses that we, uh, that we encountered in Revelation chapter 11? For anybody who uh, has, who likes to do a little added research, Daniel chapter 9, um, I would like for, for the conversation once we get into um, chapter 13, which is coming very quickly, Daniel 9, Daniel 10, um, well, let's just go ahead and go 9 through 12 is uh, really some uh, interesting reading when we get into discussing the uh, beast, which we should be encountering in chapter 13. We have been introduced to him in chapter 11, the beast that rises up out of the pit. All we know about him is he kills the two prophets, um, makes war against them and kills them. Uh, but we learn a little bit more about him. Uh, just read Daniel chapters 9 through 13. Uh, at least just a basic familiarization. So as we begin to talk about the different beasts that, that uh, Daniel sees in his vision and how those begin to apply, we can uh, kind of uh, make, some, make some parallels. Revelation chapter 11, verse 14 and 15, we want to finish up here because as you noticed, all that has happened and actually even what is about to happen in chapters 12, 13, and 14 are a interlude in between the blowing of the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. Now this will say the seventh trumpet here, and as we see that it does actually, it, it is the seventh trumpet. However, I need to make sure that I'm uh, not missing something here, but we actually do have a... Um, parallel that picks up again in Revelation chapter 15 verse 5 of what's going to happen here in this seventh, uh, seventh trumpet. So what we see is that the seventh trumpet sounds but the things that are going to happen or the things that are going to be discussed are, is kind of like information necessary for us to understand what's happening in the sounding of this trumpet and what happens going forward. See, the thing with the written word is that we have to have, there's, there's, there's information that's necessary for understanding what's come, going ahead. You've got to know the backstory. You've got to know who the characters are. You've got to know who the players, the key players are. And so he's introducing here John, in his vision that Jesus Christ has given him, is introducing a time, but then he has to drop back and give us some history, some preparation, um, give us a guideline of where he's going with this, because he, John, it was bizarre to John what he was seeing. Just imagine what it would be 2,000 years later when we're, all, we're speaking a different language than he spoke, we're living in a different country than he lived, we're living in a completely different time period. You know, yeah, of course we're living in a different time period. No, we're living in a completely different world almost. See, for centuries, they all got around the same way. You rode an animal or you rode a cart, you walked. Ships were all powered the same way. Rowing or wind. We saw an explosion in ingenuity in just the past couple of hundred years that he would have never understood in his time period. Air traffic. Just completely blow his mind away. So, beg your pardon? Cyberspace, the cloud, 
These things would have completely blown him away. But he was looking at something so bizarre. How does he communicate what was bizarre to him then to people who would have no comprehension of what he's talking about? So he's doing, he's giving us all this information. And if we listen to what the Spirit speaks to us, we can begin to put together the pieces at least coherently enough for us to get a very broad, generalized picture without maybe some of the dates and some of the names. But we can see it happening. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. I, I need to pray. Lord, thank You. Thank You that You have not left us without Your Word. Thank You that You've not left us without something to, to know what's coming. Lord, we would be desperate. Many of us find ourselves in despair now. How much more so would we find ourselves if we did not know what was coming upon the earth, that the things that we see around us is completely within your control and is natural, a uh, natural outgrowth of the sin and the degradation of our planet. But it's all part of your plan. And you have not left us without knowing that we have a part to yet to play and that there will be a fulfillment to all this. God, we don't have perfect understanding, but I pray that you'll give us wisdom as we seek your word and study it, Lord. Bless us according to your will and your grace, in Jesus' name, amen. So we see that in chapter 7, the seventh uh, trumpet blows. It's the last woe, and it says it comes quickly or without delay. It's going to happen, and this in many scholars' minds marks the midpoint, the absolute midpoint of the tribulation period. This is the end of the first three and a half years and the opening of the second three and a half years. There, it become, there comes a marked change in the vocabulary moving forward. There's a lot of re reference to repentance. There's a lot of reference to uh, getting, getting, their, getting stuff right. And there's terminology toward getting people's attention. The rest goes into the wrath of God. The purpose of the seventh trumpet. Revelation 10 and 7 says, The mystery of God should be finished as He hath declared to His servants the prophets. I believe at this point the mystery of what's taken place will come to a conclusion. That all the world will be plunged into a complete opening of what's happening. It won't be something that they can sweep under the rug anymore. It'll be wide open. It'll be blown open. In the sounding of the seventh trumpet, we find the culmination of God's plan, the final piece of the puzzle. God does not plan a peaceful... Uh, I'll get to that. I was about to get ahead of myself. Do you notice here... This thing's not working. Okay. Right here. Kingdoms... Go back. Don't make me laser beam you. Right here. <laughs> the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. Now there's a couple of references here. First of all, Jesus is taken when He is uh, basically forced into the wilderness, driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The Bible says He goes through three temptations. I'm sure He went through more, but there were three named ones. Satan buffets him in three different places. One, he knows he's hungry, so he, make, he tells him make stones into bread. Second, he knows he's unknown. He knows he's got a message he wants to proclaim, and people aren't listening. 
Not the way they should. That's the way we are today. And I'll tell you something. I believe that a lot of men who had a good message and had a good intention for what they had to say fell for this temptation of Satan to cast themselves off the pinnacle of the temple and let the Lord lift them up so that... And they thought that that would get the world's attention, but what it did was it sold themselves in compromise to the devil. They didn't start out that way, but they finished out that way because the devil got into their mind and said, you can, come, you can rise from obscurity and you can get your message out there if you will just do what I tell you to do. We, when people, they think, well, I'm just following the, the, I'm utilizing what the world has to offer. Let me tell you something. The Bible has shown us what the world has to offer. And it is not for the glory of God. It, only God's way works. We cannot use the world's way and accomplish the glory of God. And the third one was that Satan took uh, Jesus into an exceeding high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a time. I believe that that means that it was almost like a projector and through across the heavens was displayed the glories of the empires and the kingdoms, not only of Jesus' time, but every time before and every time since. And He showed Him all these things and said, I will give you these if you'll fall down and worship Me. Now that is to assume that they were Satan's to give. And at the time they were. We were given those kingdoms through Adam and Eve. We were given dominion as humanity, as God's creation, to have dominion over this planet. By submitting to the serpent and the deception in the garden, man relinquished his superiority and his dominance of this planet and gave it over into the hands of evil, into the hand of Satan. Satan has been running the kingdoms of this world ever since. People do not like to hear this because we pick our sides and we like our favorites, but even the best of our presidents and our Congress people are playing into the hands of the devil. Whether they're on the fast track or the slow boat, we're all on a collision course with Armageddon. And each one of our leaders, why do they need our prayer so desperately? Because if they are even, if there's a hint of godliness in them, they're playing Satan's game. They need us to cover them and support them. But many have, from the King James time, have reevaluated this line, and it's not plural. It is singular. As they had translated this from the Greek into the, to the English, they come up, that's not the kingdoms of this earth. Let me tell you something. There's no difference between Washington and Moscow. <sighs> Beijing, Taiwan, London, they're all the same. They're not multiple kingdoms. We see in terms of boundaries. We see in terms of nationalities and sovereign states. But the devil does not. It is one earthly global kingdom. And he is the emperor, the monarch, sitting on the throne of this world, and he controls it all. If you're not a stranger or a pilgrim in this land, then your king is the devil. Oh, well, America is a godly nation. Baloney! Your baloney has a first name. Now, I'll leave you with that so y'all can sing that the rest of your evening in your head. <laughs> there, there you go. You put that one on the sign. Now, but the kingdoms of this world is actually the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ. See, He doesn't want a kingdom subdivided 
like a parcel of land with little plots. He is this this is this is a conquest of a kingdom. One singular. And when people think about it, most of us have allegorical allegoric eyes. We have made it an allegory that God's kingdom is only in the heart. God reigns or rules a kingdom of His saints' heart currently. The kingdom of God has come and it now resides in us, in the saints of God. But Jesus is not going to sit on an allegorical throne. It is not an allegorical kingdom that He desires to establish. It is a physical, material... Everybody says, well, it's all spiritual. And they want to make... Folks, if it was all spiritual, why did He make the material? He made the material because the material matters. Come on. Come on. If the material didn't matter, He wouldn't have made it. The material matters. Yes, I know God is spirit, but He put His Son in flesh. He made His creation and He made it perfect. Very good. And He said that, that, that he, would, he would one day redeem this material world. That He would one day reign on this material world. Terra firma. One day will be terra novo, a new world. But we've got to get past this that it's just spiritual. We're fighting a spiritual warfare right now, but in some realities, it becomes material even now. You don't think that you're fighting a spiritual warfare in the material when somebody is rude to you, hateful to you, that, that spiritual warfare is crossing into the material. Sure it is. When good and evil are in opposition. Folks, the spiritual warfare took on actual lead bullets and it took on actual material when we were fighting against Hitler's Nazism. Nazism is evil. Do I think that everybody that fought in that were fighting for the right because they were fighting for God? No, I'm not talking about some holy war. But I am saying that the spiritual crossed over into the material. And I believe that. You don't have to agree with me, but I believe it. It is the kingdom's of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. We cannot coexist. Now, people see that... You've seen these bumper stickers. It's garbage. First of all, I notice that the cross is always at the end. That's where they'd like to keep us, in the back of the bus. Oh, well, it's just the way the letters fall in the Word. No, that's Satan's way of looking at it. He wants us at the back of the bus. Actually, he wants us at the back of the bus, pushed out the back door, and flopped in the street behind him. Islam. Anarchy, or the flower child hippie revolution, the homosexual revolution, feminism. We, I would say... Um, masculinism, but they, they don't appreciate that either. Uh, it, uh, Judaism, uh, Wicca, or uh, this whole um, hug a tree. Um, the, all, all this stuff that's going on out there. Paganism. God has revealed to the world that He has no intention of sharing or subdividing the earth. He's not given the... <laughs> they talk in Israel about the solution is to divide Israel and give, make a Palestinian state. Subdivide. Peace through surrender. Let me tell you something. That's a, big, that's a lie of the devil. You know the, the devil has tried to get me to find peace through surrender? 
I bet he has you too. It's, have you ever been in a temptation and the temptation comes on strong, it comes on hard, and you begin to resist and you're resisting, you can feel the spiritual warfare, it actually becomes real in your life, that spiritual one-on-one -on -one warfare, and the devil lets you, kind of whispers to you, I'll quit if you will. Have you ever given over to a temptation in a moment because you just couldn't keep fighting anymore, so you surrendered? Come on. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but I can guarantee that you have. And you give over to that temptation in a moment because you just... So you surrender. Do you get peace from your surrender? No, you don't get peace. It's a lie. It is a deception. There is no peace in surrender and God is not a God of surrender. He will not bow before Muhammad or Allah. He will not bow before some made up pagan goddess. He will not even bow to the Jude Jewish ways of doing things now. God is God. He's not going to bow to what Christians have turned Him into. He will lay claim to all the kingdoms of the world and He will reign over them. He will rule this planet. It may seem insignificant. I've heard a bunch of these scientists and scholars and all these people. What in the world would God have any interest in one insignificant planet in a giant cosmos of millions and maybe billions of planets and trillions of stars? Why would God have any interest in this one? They forget that the rest of it was made for us. He put us on this planet and He did all these things to show His glory to us. What makes this... What, we're, what I see is the awe and the majesty of the cosmos is so... And why are we so interested in the insignificance of out there when what we've got is right here? The entire universe was made to reflect His glory to His creation. To us. It is, all informative to the, uh, it is also informative to the Christian. We will not become equal with God. He will be our God and we shall be His people. He alone will reign. There's people who get a weird, kind of warped notion that they're going to become like little mini-gods. We will not. Yes, sir. Oh. We will not become miniature gods. See, we may become timeless, but we had a beginning. If you are created, no matter how long you live or how powerful you become, you will never be more than that which was created. And to be created means that there must be something above you that created you. And so no matter how great we become, we will still be created beings. And the 4 and 20 elders, this is a worship service. And this is a forevermore worship service. This is praise and worship at its best. Four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Whose great power? His own great power. Do you know that God in many ways has withheld His great power? Because if He unleashed his great power, our sins would vaporize before Him. We could not stand in the presence of His great power. He has withheld much of what He is, but one day He will unleash His fury upon this world, upon the sin that we have brought upon this world. His wrath will be felt. 
The reason people play with God is because somewhere down deep they either don't think God exists or they see Him as weak. We do not truly understand God. I would say that very few of us even truly fear and reverence God the way He deserves. The nations were angry. Where does this, does anybody, can anybody remember where that, where, what that sounds like? It's in the Psalms. Psalm chapter 2. Why does the heathen rage? You remember that? Why, and, the, and the people imagine a vain thing. It says the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. Do you see the change here? Before it was, there, there were words of hope and there were words of toward repentance. And now it says thy wrath has come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. Now we got words of wrath and judgment. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Wrath, judgment, destruction, rewards. What we see here is a finality, isn't it? That lets me know that the last three and a half years is going to go by almost in, in uh, like stop motion, man. It's going to be moving. That might not even been a great analogy. It's going to be moving fast. It's going to be moving quickly, rapidly. Huh? Warp speed. The temp and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in His temple the ark of, the te of His testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Now, Hebrews chapter 9, actually chapter 8 and chapter 9, in the book of Hebrews, the writer begins to describe that the things that were on the earth, the tabernacle first and the instruments which were in it, and then when Solomon actually constructed the temple and the instruments that were in it, they were nothing more than a shadow or a type of what was seen in heaven. See, one thing I've never thought about until I got to study and I got to listening and reading, when Moses goes up on the mount and God shows him and he says, I want you to build this tabernacle after the similitude of, of what you have seen. I believe that Moses seen the temple that truly exists and that's the one in heaven. I believe that the menorah and the altar, the bronze altar, the table of showbread, the Ark of the Covenant. See, who made the covenant? Don't say God and man. Because God made the covenant. He gave man his part, but God cut the covenant with Abraham. He made the covenant with uh, Israel. The covenant is forever more established. The Ark of the Covenant that we had down here on this planet, which is now lost. Nobody, nobody but Indiana Jones knows where it's at. That was a joke. Cultural reference, insert here. But um, nobody knows where the Ark of the Covenant currently is. There's some who believe it's in Ethiopia, if you study that. There's some who believe that it was actually hidden by the prophet Jeremiah in the, in the catacombs beneath the temple mount by uh, Jeremiah. In those, that, that There was a labyrinth of tunnels built by Solomon, from what I understand, under the temple mount, if that is indeed the temple mount. And so nobody's really sure where the ark is. We do know from the scripture that over a periods of time, the, imp, the, the things that were placed in the ark, anybody name what was in the ark? There's three things placed in the ark. Staff, man, show his manna, manna, and the commandments. The staff, uh, y'all did it. Collectively, congratulations. There was a, pot, a golden pot of manna. There was Aaron's rod that budded and produced almonds. And then there was the, the tables or the 
the stone tables of the testimony or the Ten Commandments were actually placed in it. We know that throughout time that the, the, thing, the contents of the ark were lost. And then finally the ark itself was lost. But the Bible says that the, the, the temple of God was opened in heaven. Now this is also reflected in uh, chapter 15. That the temple is open in heaven. That gives me the reason, if it was already open in chapter 11, and then it's open again in chapter 15, why note it? Was it reclosed? I think it is to give us the understanding that this flows into this. And everything else in between is kind of, it's kind of like the, uh, the, uh, the cream in between the two Oreo cookies. <laughs> And there, were, uh, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. I believe that one of the great things about this statement is that God, His side of the covenant, His side of the testament, still endures. We lost ours. We broke ours. We misplaced ours. But He kept His. Yes. But an earthquake in heaven, I, you know, I don't see heaven as a well, I don't. I, I looked at that as not in heaven. The no, the the temple was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. But then I believe that 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 the the process of opening up the temple, the glory of God. The Bible talks about when the glory filled the temple, and Isaiah saw it that his glory filled the place, and it drove everybody out. That when God's glory comes, the Bible talks about God's glory coming down on top of Mount Sinai and the earth quaked and there was lightning and thunder and, and all this. I believe that when God's glory is actually unleashed, it causes ter uh, turmoil, turbulence, if you will, on, 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 the, on our planet. Yes. Yes. That's a nice rendering, artist rendering. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, you imagine the ma uh, majesty and grandeur of the of the uh, the world that we have now. They're beautiful places, beautiful places. I've seen places that I could just I just soon stop and stay there. Just imagine what it's going to be like when God remakes this planet. All right. Uh. Chapter twelve we get into a different type of discussion. Chapter 12 is basically an overview. It is an overview. At one point, I did a lesson very similar to this, and I called it Christmas in the Stars. And I actually based it upon Revelation chapter 12 because it tells basically the Christmas story. But it tells it in highly symbolic terms, and it tells it not in the uh, detail of the literalness of Christ coming and being born of Mary, but it tells it in a broader sense. Because the incarnation impacts more than just, it was more than baby Jesus. Okay? There's a lot of people that love Christmas and they love baby Jesus. They wouldn't worship God for nothing. You following me? In a, in, a, in a sweet and precious sacrilege, they accept Jesus in a manger, but they cannot accept a God on a throne. The baby's not scary. There's no respect there. It's a, it, it becomes a quaint little story. People like quaint little stories. And they like the little, the little imagery that goes with it. But here's an imagery that takes Christmas and blows the doors open. And so when we're not going to start chapter 12. But if you would like to read in advance of our study next Wednesday on Revelation chapter 12, please read Genesis chapter 37, 
beginning with verse 5 and reading at least down through verse 11. Familiarize yourself with Genesis chapter 37, verses 5 through 11. This is going to be important for our discussion. Um, There are several other references. I would ask you to read through Revelation chapter 12. I think that it would be beneficial for you to have a, a working understanding of what we're going to be discussing. Um, let's see here. Yes. Thirty-seven. <laughs> Cheater. There you go. Genesis thirty-seven verses five through eleven. Thirty-seven verse five through eleven. We're going to be introduced to a cosmic warfare, an angel war. Now, for ind- for for young folks, this should really pique your curiosity because you really have a Warfare. And people go, that sounds so much like, I mean, some, some kind of science fiction or something. It sounds so supernatural. It is supernatural. They say, well, it sounds alien. It is alien. <laughs> this is going to be, this is a, the, people sh- cringe from, from this kind of, this kind of topic because it sounds so (laughs) otherworldly. But what we find is that we have an aunt's understanding. Not like an aunt and uncle understanding. An ant, like an insect ant. Our world is so tiny by comparison to the reality that that is around us. The reality that it is so much bigger than our comprehension. We have, we, have, we have boiled our existence down to solid objects, to pleasures or pain. We've boiled our existence down to how does it impact me? To the degree that we cannot comprehend that there are other people in the world that have no comprehension of you. Who has not been in the situation where you've been in a... Someone close to you has died. And here you are in the the funeral procession. And you look out the window and you see people just going, they're going to the grocery store, they're going to Walmart, they're listening to the radio, they got their top down, their hair blowing in the breeze. They couldn't care less about the fact that you're hurting at this moment. And you want the world to stop because you're hurting. See, that is our reality. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that put too fine a point on it? I think it really opens us up to our own Arrogance. But this world, there's things going on around us that we can't even begin to imagine. And when, the, when it's opened up and the, the people begin to see, <laughs> I know that I hear people talk of what they're going to do when they get to heaven. I've heard songs about it. Boy, I'm going to run up and I'm going to go do this and I'm going to ask this question. And I... When we're ripped, and the Bible uses the term ripped, harpazoed, called up, snatched violently from this, this existence, and we end up in heaven, <laughs> one minute you're on your way to work and the next minute you're on your way to the marriage supper I would like to say we'll worship but we will be so completely shocked by what we're experiencing and encountering our mind will not know how to handle what we're seeing because it's never huh? I don't know 
All I know is that we will go from one reality into a broader reality. I believe where our senses will be accosted by and assaulted by sensations that we've never experienced. We'll be in snap overload. You know what I mean? Colors that you've never seen. Sounds you've never heard. We are, we're, we're used to a pain somewhere, even the youngest of us. Can you imagine taking a step and your body says, that didn't hurt. And trust me, you ignore it right now, but your body will tell you, that didn't hurt. And before long, you'll be trying out legs that didn't work like this before. And you'll be trying out arms. And folks, I believe that we have no idea what we're going to be, you know, what we're going to see. It's just, it's going to blow us away. It's going to blow us away. It's interesting because the Bible actually says multiple times that Aaron stretched out the rod. That Aaron stretched out the rod. Whose rod was it? Was it Moses' rod? Was it Aaron's rod? We do know Aaron had a rod, and the reason that Aaron, I believe that the reason Aaron's rod was put in is because it was a symbol of the priesthood. That was a challenge. You know, they set them up, whoever's rod could bud. And we're talking a dead stick. By the word rod, it was a dead stick. Whichever one, because there was a question, who, who, should be, who should have the right to be the priests? God said, I chose Aaron and his sons. Well, the people didn't like that. So they had a, a contest. Aaron's rod not only budded, but produced almonds. And we're talking about didn't just bloom, but fruited. That doesn't happen overnight, no matter whether it's still growing on the tree. But it happened overnight. And I believe it was a symbol of the continuing priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood that went from Aaron and would continue down through. And I believe that would be personified in Jesus. Well, it turned into a snake. <laughs> um, and it ate another stick. Um, <laughs> no, it never blossomed or budded. But it was a stick. It was a stick-eating stick. So um, I wonder, did it get bigger? Did it get fatter? You know, man, it just fit my hand just right. Now I got to whittle it down or something. Well, when you think about it, what do the three th things in the, in the ark, what did they represent? God's provision with the, manna, the pot of manna. God's, and then the, the sacrifices with Aaron's rod, it would have represented the sacrificial system or the, 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 uh, the birth of that religion because they didn't have sacrifices and everything the way that they understood it before the law. And then the Ten Commandments, which represented God's expectations, the law that would be necessary. I believe that that sacrifice, that sacrificial system, was to point to the fact that God provided, even though we couldn't fulfill the law. <laughs> it all points us to Christ. Everything in the Old Testament points us to Christ. All right. So next, next Wednesday, if the Lord's willing and He tarries, and I would just as soon learn about this from heaven as anywhere else. Wouldn't you? I'd just as soon God say, oh, next week, chapter 12. And while we're all sitting around the, the table at the marriage supper, right? come on. Come on, next, 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 next Wednesday, we'll talk about Re Revelation chapter 12. Y'all up for it? You betcha, Lord. But until then, we'll keep studying our, uh, as we can. 
And if the Lord tarries, we'll try Revelation chapter 12 next, next uh, Wednesday. Any questions, comments, hymnals to throw? So I'll stand will be dismissed. Thank you for your patience. Continue to pray. Our church is becoming more and more open in our worship. Thank God. Our church is growing and maturing in our understanding and biblical knowledge. Praise the Lord. We really need to strive to become pliable in the Spirit's hands. To be used by the Spirit as He wills. Submit ourselves. So let's pray. Sister Brenda, will you dismiss us, please?